perhaps the rarest poem on earth, an epic poem. <laughs> it took how long to write? How many have ever been written? A handful. That's it. Can, Can anybody name, name one that has been written in the last 345 years since Milton's Paradise Lost? What epic poem, truly epic, I'm talking about in the English language. I'm going to cheat. What's been written? <laughs> well, I'm going to Google it. Cheat? What, what, in what sense? I'm going to Google it. Google it. Well, uh, I submit there is no epic poem that has been written in the English language since 1667. I'm aware of one before you, that. Pardon me? I'm aware of one. Many before that. You've got Dante, we've got Homer, we've got Virgil, the Roman poet. Uh, but when we look at the modern world, now many scholars say this, this is the, the you know, the, many other reputable pe people, other than my own biased view here, one might worry or argue, uh, uh, there are no epic poems. Byron, Lord Byron wrote a fragment. He never completed it. He himself admitted he had no plot. He just launched into it, started writing it. He didn't know how to end it, and he died before finishing it. So it's not even finished. Ezra Pound, the same thing. It's an American poet, uh, early modern, modernist. It's a fragment. He never finished it. He himself admitted to the poet Donald Hall before he died. After he had, he, he, uh, Donald Hall visited him when he was in a, a, a mental institution. And uh, 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 having been put in there for, for anti-American sort of uh, broadcasts uh, 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 under Mussolini's fascism during World War II, if you're not familiar with it. And anyway, Ezra Pound admitted he had no structure, no theme, and it made no sense to Donald Hall. So when we look at everything in the modern realm, scholars, critical people have all uh, uh, pondered this really for well over a century now. What's happened to epic poetry? commonplaces, it's gone into the novel, uh, uh, and so on. But I submit, novels do not have an epic vision the way that only poetry can have it, only epic poetry. Uh, the form of prose does not carry the emotion and intensity that poetry does. So, yes, uh, 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 my claim that I have written the first epic poem, it could have dawned on me at one point, my God, there it is on my desk, I've written the first epic poem in 345 years. What brought that? 30 years of study, work, and uh, the handout I've given you by E.M.W. Tilliard, uh, old, uh, uh, old school uh, uh, scholar, from uh, the early, uh, uh, the late 19th century, really, and into the early uh, uh, half of uh, uh, the, the 20th, wrote one book on epic poetry and an uh, article as well early on uh, in 1936. So uh, I believe Tilliard has an especial, unique insight into what the requirements are for epic poetry. At the very least, I say, of all the scholars I read and studied, and as a young man, 30 years ago, thinking about, I want to write an early epic poem. I want to write an epic poem. I don't want to write lyric poems. I want the most challenging form. And I felt only the most challenging form could bear my sense of human experience and find expression. I could find expression in it. So anyway, uh, my earliest notes for my poem, The Parliament of Poets, go back to 1982. And uh, I've been actively writing for four and a half years, uh, have uh, uh, several drafts done. It's going to be published in November. Now, all I'm stating in that is the fact of what I've done. I've written what I believe is an epic poem. I don't say it's the best epic poem. I don't say I've outdone Homer and Dante and everybody else. All I can say is, it's on my desk. It's no longer, I mean, I reached a point where I was shocked. My God, it's no longer my 
head. It's not out there. I'm, I spent 30 years studying and reading books, and then someday I want to do this. So uh, that marks a new stage for me as a man and as a poet. And uh, it's really up to readers to decide whether I've done it. I recognize that and know that. Maybe I failed. Maybe I completely don't live up to the standard. And it's the highest standard in the world of poetry. Not only Western poetry, but in India, right? Yeah. Uh, you've got Vyasa, Mahabharata, the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Valmiki, Tulsidas, all those great Indian poets. And even in India, there's only a handful of epics. Yeah, they, they oh, very old. Very old. Yeah. The great visionary poets of Indian civilization were all epic. And um, uh, so anyway, East or West, I submit, commonplace among scholars and thoughtful people, readers, serious readers, it's a very rare poem. And one problem I've discovered over the last years here in talking to people is getting anybody to believe that somebody today in postmodernism, uh, we all talk about po writing, writing postmodern themes, uh, uh, everyday life, uh, uh, all those things you know that, that constitute that. And how could anyone today write or find an epic theme? We're no longer living in an epic age. Well, I think Tilliard has much to say about that kind of thinking. I'm going to read the first passage here by uh, E.M.W. E. Tilliard about epic uh, poetry, sir. Thank you. Distinctions between authentic and artificial epics. Attempts to confine epic to verse or to a grand, special grand style are hazardous and confusing. It is safer to require but three qualities of epic. that it should be narrative on a large scale, that it should be so serious as to merit the epithet universal, and that it should be positive rather than critical. It, sh could, it, it could explain the third, po I, I could explain the third postulate, that epic should be positive rather than critical by saying that on balance, by and large, epic in its narrative sphere should correspond to the tragic rather than to the comic in the dramatic sphere. So it's got to be tragic, it's not comic. Now when, and this is important because the many, many of the would-be modern, that's fine. That, that went, like, many, when you went like that, nope, you the thing, nope, I thought those would be bones. I was like, no, no, no cue there, just coincidence. <laughs> many of the would-be epic poet, poems since Milton are mock epics. Uh, uh, old poet, English poet named Cooper wrote a poem called The Task, which was a mock, mock epic. Um, uh, uh, James Merrill, uh, roughly, uh, you know, sort of uh, post-World War II the, through the 70s and so on, 80s, wrote a book, uh, uh, The Changing Light at Sandover, uh, which is, I argue, a mock epic in that he, it's based on a Ouija board. And uh, uh, it has the uh, British poet W.H. Auden showing up uh, 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 at one point and communicating from the dead. You know, it's not this seriousness that Tilliard and really the broad population of readers throughout Western or Eastern civilization think of as epic. It's got to be serious. And it has to have that, vi it has to find and articulate a vision of life uh, in, in a unique way. Next passage here from, is, while at, home, while at home in large areas of life, the epic writer must be centered in the normal. He must measure the crooked by the straight. He must capture that sanity which has been claimed for true genius. Granted the fundamental sanity, the wider the epic poet's mental span, the better. And ideally, he should be able to range from the simple sensualities to a susceptibility to the numinous. So there's a span uh, as well. And I would argue the simple sensualities 
the joys and uh, uh, fruits of the earth from from food experience the in a way the postmodern average experience of everyday life but to the numinous as well and there and whether that numinous is western however you want to conceive that or you want to conceive it as indian uh, the the uh, 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 you know, the uh, uh, Upanishads mentioned earlier, or the Vedas, and whatever else you want to include, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, yeah, so there's still that sense of transcendent or numinous that somehow Homer has within Greek world and religion. And Virgil, the Roman poet who wrote the Aeneid, great poem, there's numinous there in terms of his own conception. Uh, the Numean, uh, I, I may be uh, misremembering uh, here, uh, uh, oracles or, or whatever they were. were uh, pardon me? The I Ching. The I Ching. Not, not the I Ching, not for Virgil. Uh, that's really Chinese. Virgil's really uh, dealing with Roman mystery religions in a way pre pre there a little bit uh, so anyway Tillier's making those kinds of reflections here too how do we find that in a world of nihilism post Christianity and, and so on this is the challenge that all poets have been up against for the last hundred years in the West, and even in India, there are poets who go through all this too, like Dilip Chitra we were talking the other day and so forth. So, uh, next key point I think Tilliard makes is the whole, the whole however long, should remain fluid. The whole of the poem, it has to remain fluid while you're writing it. And this is one of the key insights I, I got from Tilliard because it helped me find a way in this sense into working the material. Should remain fluid and unset till the last word has been written. That the writer should have everything simultaneously in mind and keep it, keep it open to modification through the process of composition. This must remain an ideal for no man has possessed the powers of memory and control necessary to fulfill it. Even Dante was inconsistent. Now, I am there. <laughs> I hope I, I, I achieved uh, uh, better here, but uh, we'll see. Some, uh, some scholar will doubtlessly dig up a flaw here somewhere or another in my poem if uh, I ever find readers for it. But I assert uh, <laughs> I've, I've avoided those negative pro problems. And indeed, I put my epic poem through several drafts. And I understand what he's saying about it. It's very difficult when you take a 300-page epic poem and I, for a very long time, I thought about what's the length of an epic poem? You know, Homer uh, had four or five hundred pages, Dante and whoever. That's much too long for a modern reader, modern reader uh, today, I felt. Also, my experience of living in uh, Japan and traveling all over China and studying Indian literature and elsewhere, I, I have something as a writer I want to say to the entire world east as well as west. I've lived in the, in the east. I've studied it all my life from a, a high school student, uh, world religions and so forth and philosophies. And I aspire to saying something to humanity. Uh, I would not be happy or content only to speak to Americans or the UK. No, thank you. English has become the world language de facto of over 1.2 billion plus people. And uh, having had students in Japan, I know many of my students were capable of reading a long book in English. <clears throat> Four or 500 pages would have put them off. So I, I came, uh, struggling for years over this, I finally came to the point of roughly 300 or less, which is what I've got. And uh, I hope that uh, by dealing with every region and continent on the earth, every major religious or spiritual tradition, wisdom tradition, uh, the Aborigines in Australia, American Indians and so forth are in my poem, that uh, people from various walks of humanity can find it engaging and be willing to consider and read it. 
is part of my thinking here too, and I, I hope I've done that. So, uh, Tilliard helped me think in those terms, uh, is what I'm trying to point out. Next point, spontaneity will not suffice. And the author will have to summon his will to help him abide by the plans he has resolved on. The writing of any poem, except one dictated in dream or trance, needs some effort of the will to control and shape it. But the effort is different in a lyric, a short story, and a play. While only in the most intensely written long works is the will taxed to the utmost. Now, uh, I think this is a very uh, important point because we all know, and I've written uh, a, a book, my first book, Into the Ruins, is all lyric poems mostly with some uh, uh, several dramatic monologues that I was moving towards. I had decided very early on I don't want to write a lot of books. I want to write a handful of books that I hope are my best and worth people's time. And so I very much decided I'm going to write a book of lyric poems. I'm going to work with some long poems in that book, dramatic monologues basically, and move, learn how to tell a longer story or poem. And then my second book was a book length narrative poem. Not an epic, just a narrative poem telling a story. And then uh, I would write an epic. And uh, as building blocks in a sense. Now, uh, his point here too is, you know, that, that the will uh, I, I really feel, feel there, there, there's a very insightful understanding here uh, that, that Tilliard had that helped me figure out what it was I was doing and how to do it. That uh, it was an act of will. I've had all those lyric poems where uh, it's a beautiful sunset, it's, uh, it's uh, reacting to a moment in life of inspiration, ekphrasis to a, an art object. And, and so on, and uh, so there's that epiphany of lyric poetry and that beauty. But for an epic poem, you're telling a tale, and you're, 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 there's got to be a form, a structure, and a length that one moment of inspiration can't sustain. So it really is this finding a theme and a vision of life and having the will to pursue it and develop it fully and then to stick to it. He makes the point here too, perhaps in the next passage. This exercise of the will and the belief in it helped to associate epic poetry with the largest human move movements and solidest human institutions. And in creating what we call civilization, the, the sheer human will has been a major part. Uh, uh, and and I, I think the, his extending it out of poetry into the, that civilization is an act of will to, uh, if you think about Homer, Virgil especially, Virgil is creating this vision of life for the Romans after, uh, I, I spent one part of my life studying uh, Roman history extensively when I was quite young and, and uh, the Roman history has this whole republic period and then it breaks down into a sort of a warring state and there's all this chaos and mass murder and slaughter that goes on about a hundred years or more of, of war. Virgil's born right at the end of that. And so he has that at his back. And, he, and Augustus Caesar is trying, to, uh, creates an empire and, and wants an epic poet to create a vision that will help, help focus people understanding of Roman life, where we're going, and pull people together, unify people, provide Rome with a vision. And that is commonly said in uh, Virgilian scholarship, Roman, uh, Virgil did that. And uh, in an analogous way, I mean, I fought long and hard about what is, what would be for our time, what is analogous on, on, a, on a human level and on a practical political level. Tilliard embellishes that more. There's nothing so exciting and so awe-inspiring in the world of letters as the spectacle of a great spirit daring to risk everything on one great venture and knowing that in its execution he would be taxed to the limit of what a man can endure. 
English literature, uh, there are many echoes of this idea through it of, of casting your whole lot on one book. And it's been said of uh, uh, Spencer as an epic poet, it's been said of uh, Milton, uh, of the epic poet, that that's what the epic poet really does because it takes a whole lifetime to create, to live into it, to understand it, and to work deep enough into it that it really becomes the vision uh, that engages oneself and one's readers. The, uh, next passage here, the epic writer must express the feelings of a large, large group of people living in or near his own time. The notion that the epic is primarily patriotic is an unduly narrowed vision of this requirement. But the group feeling need not be national. Dante is medieval rather than Italian. I think this is like a brilliant insight too. Maybe it, you know, someone will say, well, how commonplace, but you know, it's so true. I mean, and of course that was uh, medieval uh, European civilization uh, versus the, the local fiefdoms and so forth. Yes, exactly. And Latin tied them together, brought, uh, created the unity of, of civilization. The Roman Catholic Church did, the, uh, and so forth. And uh, uh, that's already beginning to crumble by the time Dante writes. So he's summing that up. It's often been said that the f epic poetry comes when a civilization really is on its last legs, is collapsing. It's a full, full restatement of, the, of, of that civilization, the best in it, where have where we been, where are we going, where is our future? So it's like Virgil, this vision out there of, of, of where we can go. And, and I hope in some ways I found a way to articulate a global vision, not just na American nationalistic. I couldn't, I, having always had a very international global experience, that would be not enough. That which must not be lost. I, I'd agree with that, and you know, it would be entirely contrary, I argue, to the whole experience of American poet and writers. When you think of Walt Whitman, Whitman was all about you charging toward universality. He didn't find a form which, in he, which he wrote a true epic poem. But his vision is pushing towards the epic. There are scholars who argue he is an epic poem, you know, even though Song of Myself being personal and, and uh, ident the self and the individual and all of that. Uh, well, yeah, not tragic. That's what is really, one of the major constituents he really lacks, I'd argue too. Move to the next passage. Final passage here at the bottom. We can simplify even further and say no more than that the epic must communicate the feeling of what it was like to be alive at that time. But that feeling must include the condition that behind the epic author is a big multitude of men of whose most serious convictions and dear habits he is the mouthpiece. Epic must have faith in the system of beliefs or way of life it bears witness to. Only when people have faith in their own age can they include the maximum of life in their vision and exert their will to its utmost capacity. Uh, so uh, again, this idea that Homer speaks for Greek civilization, Virgil for Roman, obviously Dante for Christian Europe and whatever, Mil Milton sort of Protestant Christi Christian Europe, and uh, Vyasa for that whole period of time, and uh, uh, who else, you know, uh, it, it goes along that way. So, uh, and Ramayana is even, you know, expansive like that. And Ramayana, more than, you know, uh, I've studied the Ramayana, and I came to a realization that Westerners really don't understand the Ramayana, how important it is. It, it it's just pervades India. There's a tendency in the West, I think, uh, to dismiss the Ramayana because it has uh, Hanuman in it. It's kind of a monkey king. Well, Hanuman is in my epic, and Sun Wukong from Chinese civilization, the monkey king, uh, they sometimes, you know, they uh, are identified as brothers in some Chinese literature and others. Uh, so 
Uh, they both spoke to me, and one of my cha challenges I felt was to find a way to get in, to, to reach readers from those traditions, China and India, and to use as characters major characters from the great poets of each civilization who won the hearts and minds of them in the past, and to extend the conversation, make them alive and breathe life through my experience in modern days into them. So uh, anyway, I touch on that. A lot of things like that in my work is uh, 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 I'm dealing with there. And uh, the Ramayana is such a profound story. Uh, just a, a one brief note on it too. It's not only India. Ramayana is important all through Cambodia, Thailand, down in Java, Indonesia, and everywhere, uh, Vietnam to Vietnam and so forth. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, that covers Tillier. Do you have any comments, questions, or uh, sure agreement or disagreements? Yeah. What? I totally agree with you um, as an ethic because I just saw the poem, and it was like going back to my earliest memory, and then I said, well, I wrote it down, and then I said, well, gee, yeah, this part needs to be taken out, but that was part of the beginning of life that I can recall. And okay. so when I finished it, it was like, no, it has to continue because that's, okay. I did the 360 from that point right. to today, and now to come back again. Okay. And so it was like, what you're saying, I totally agree, you just can't leave out part of it, and then yep. expect that that's the final say. Right. You have to finish with this. Here's this. A new poet, a new And these here. And who, who are the, are there modern ethics writers of, or people even attempting it? He did. Well, uh, I, 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 I mentioned that those poets who are usually thought of uh, or, or the claim is made stra it's under strain trying to justify it, that this po uh, uh, poet or another is an epic poet. Really, they're not epic poets. Not as defined, I argue, uh, with Tilliard. Tilliard and other writers and scholars would argue too. We don't have a true epic. And uh, we want to, so we kind of stretch the definitions to make it, make it fit this, this guy here or whoever. And uh, uh, why in itself is a, is a study in itself. Now, what I just handed out to you is my, my own... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the, the fact that it says, you know, it has to be tragic. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't digest the fact, actually. Because sometimes, you know, I think poetry, it has a theme for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it can't be comedy, that, that's true. But yeah. It has to be tragic, uh, that kind of... Yeah. You know, because there, there have been epic poetry, for example, let's say Ramayana, it has a theme. Yes. It is tragic in parts, but the ending is really happy ending. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. Yeah. So, uh, Vahevi, you're saying yeah. uh, that epic poet in India is not always tragic? Yeah. Okay, I think there, I hear what you're saying. The Ramayana does have a happy ending in that that uh, yeah, had an epic that, yeah, that Radha yeah. is saved at the end from the evil beings uh, from Ravana? It was uh, Sita. Sita, rather. Yeah, Sita, rather. Thank you for correcting me. And uh, C Sita uh, marries uh, Rama at the end yeah. and so forth. But I argue, you know, you have the Asuras all the way through. You have Rakshasas. Uh, you have Ravana, who's an evil character. Yeah. So there's all that tragedy yeah. in there that there's evil, they'll kill you, you know, they'll, they're going to carpet bomb Europe when you're not looking, they're going to incinerate you and everything else. You know, so that dark side of humanity is engaged with in the Ramayana, and I would argue that's one of the reasons it's spread all over Southeast Asia, because it's true to life. We experience not only the good and happy endings, we human beings in every culture produce trauma, tragedy, and violence. Yeah, you're so, right, right in that sense that the, 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 
although the ending is happy, but in between there are a lot of tragedies. Yeah, a lot, a lot of tragedies. In, in Mahabharata as well. Mahabharata too, because on the field of Kur Kurukshetra, it's all battle. It was war. Yeah. It's war, they're all, uh, yeah. they're slaughtering one another. And, and that's where I agree that it, uh, it's not comedy at all. Yeah. Nowhere there's a, a thing of comedy or a hint of comedy yeah. anywhere. In that's a good point. And, and I would say almost 40 to 50 percent of the would-be epics in the English language after Milton are really mock epics in that way because they're comedy in that way too without going into them. So anyway, this is a, a short piece I've written about some of my own reflections on also grappling with, well, what, what is important in epic poetry for me as a particular writer and uh, uh, foremost for me was Aristotle's Poetics. The Poetics is a very ancient work about poetry. Aristotle is talking about, uh, at times, Homer and how Homer's, uh, the, the structured, po his poetry, where did he find his theme, uh, what were the embellishments of the poetry, what made it epic, and uh, it's really one of the, the, I would argue, the greatest statement about epic poetry. Uh, now, uh, some of it, I would say, is, is limited to that time, but there are vast universals here in Aristotle that spoke to me, at least as a young poet struggling with uh, my own grappling to find uh, epic vision, and I argue at the very end uh, uh, that Aristotle even defines and speaks to Indian poetry. I'm thinking of Indian poetry. China does not produce a long epic poem in the sense of India in the West, where it's 300 pages long or something plus, uh, but, uh, and the same is true of Japan, but Basho, the, uh, I, I believe Basho's one, one book, uh, 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 journey to uh, to the uh, on a narrow road to the north. Narrow road to the north is really an epic vision in terms of haiku. He's really a haiku poet, but through prose and mixing it, he creates an epic vision. And it is tragic at times too, deep down. There's a very tragic sensibility in Basho for the ephemerality of life and how impermanent it is. And in Japanese context, that is, I think, uh, the tragic and. Same thing in China. Du Fu, who's one of, uh, Basho and, and Du Fu are both as characters in my poem. And Du Fu is a Chinese poet who uh, never quite finds a master in a sense of the J Japanese ronin, if you will, uh, uh, samurai without a, uh, a master. Uh, du Fu can never find an emperor who will uh, employ him and use his services, but but the, the scholar-poet ideal of Chinese civilization is to serve the emperor uh, in a Confucian way and help create a peaceful, stable civilization. So uh, that in itself becomes an epic vision of, uh, uh, in Du Fu's work, I, I think, and many uh, so other scholars, Chinese scholars, have argued it is in, within Chinese civilization an epic vision. So, um, uh, anyway, I mentioned that too. Now, uh, on here, I talk about Ezra Pound, a few other things that I've already touched on. I don't know if uh, you really want to read this or not or touch on it. Um, I, I do have a handout of five questions on uh, uh, we, we could do if, if you'd like, or we could. Uh, uh, Let's do it. Talk. You want to do it? To hand out? Uh, let me read these questions and see what you think. Epic poetry exercise. Question one. List what epic poets, East or West, you have read personally. Have you actually read them? Make a list of what you think. Number two, make a list of what you think are their defining characteristics. What do they have in common or what, what is universal? what would be the definition of an epic out of your reading. Three, the epic poems that have quote unquote stuck to the ribs of any culture are relatively few that lodged in the heart, let's say. Why? What do you make of it? Uh, 
be interesting to hear people's thoughts in that way. Four, what do you think of Aristotle and Tilliard's conceptions of epic poetry? Five, do you have an idea for an epic poem? Write it down in as much detail as you can. Use the back if necessary. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, it, uh, just reading that makes me realize there's, there's one point of Aristotle's that I should, I should read so it makes sense from the, the, the questions here. And that's the first quotation on the second page here. Uh, uh, Ar Aristotle, uh, just as the introduction to it, Aristotle was right in so many ways, nowhere more than when he wrote in the Poetics, a useful critical work, uh, he writes, so, so from these considerations it is evident that the poet should be a maker of his plots more than of his verses insofar as he is a poet by virtue of his imitations and what he imitates is actions. The idea that an epic, the heart of the epic poem isn't the embellishments of language, the verse. Modern world is in, obsessed with formalism. The baubles, I would argue, of poetry, these surface qualities. Aristotle's arguing it's the plot. The, the poet means maker. And Aristotle argues the epic poet is first and foremost the maker of his plot. And the plot at the deepest level is the real test. And really and truly it is why I spent from 1982 when I first wrote a sketch outline of my first uh, epic plot, wadded it up and not, almost threw it away, you know, and shoved it away somewhere out of sight. And, and it, I just went year after year reading, studying all the great poets east and west. How can I create a plot that engages modern life, east and west, uh, and so on, and has a chance, I hope, of speaking to the globe, not just the west. Uh, so anyway, I feel Aristotle is just uh, very, very helpful. That's basically his idea. And that's what I'm alluding to in a series of questions here, too, then. So let me give that to you. Thank you.